Well, I want to invite you to go in your Bible or on in your Bible to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. This is my journal last year, um, March 18th. Um, and I wrote, tomorrow I'm planning to start preaching through Romans. I feel so inadequate, so much like an imposter, a parrot, so inferior to preach this. God, please, please keep me from error, keep me from pride, keep me from being overly theological, keep me devotional, keep me practical, and keep me passionate. And I want to pray that again as we get back into Romans after being away from it since the end of November. Uh, so let's pray together. Father, would you help us now? Lord, help us as that we, the, the meaning that you intended for the book of Romans and the heart and the passion that it would be for your people, for your church, that it would be conveyed and that we would grasp it. And Lord, we pray that you would use this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you had the job of, and you were tasked to address a group of Christians that had a deep cultural and practical division within their church community that had spanned generations and that there was a lot of internal conflict and they really weren't connected to the broader church as far as with the apostles and um, that there was a lot of discussion about uh, and division in the church about uh, special days and whether their religious days should be observed or eating of meats or how uh, the Jewish culture and the Gentile culture should be expressed in the church. How would you address them? What would you talk to them about? Um, and if we, when we see how Paul did that to the church at Rome, it kind of reminds us what is most important uh, and what ought to be our center as well. And so today is a bit of a um, reminding ourselves of what Romans is about and where we've been, a little review of how we got there, kind of rekindling our thoughts and then ramping back up to finish the book of Romans this year, Lord willing. So I'm just calling this re-Romans. So, so remind, review, rekindle, re-ramp, um, or ramp up, or whatever. Uh, get, get some re's there. Um, and so we're going to kind of go over uh, who wrote Romans, what was going on, and then kind of a survey of the emphasis of where we are up to chapter 7 right now. And so let's begin reading in Romans chapter 1 just to kind of wet ourselves because he does give a sense of a, of, of a theme or a passion center of the book of Romans. And so it is good for us to um, hear this. And, and maybe if you, so the first Christians, when they received the letters of Paul, uh, they, they probably didn't, as they were coming from the ship, run to the FedEx Kinkos and make a bunch of copies and hand out or Xerox them. They would have one person read aloud, and then they would be sitting there hearing this letter from Paul to the church. And so uh, I think it's good for us uh, as you're following along. So I want to read a, a good portion here of Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, Concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. 
For God is my witness, whom I serve it with my spirit in the gospel of his Son without ceasing. I mention to you always in my prayer, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is God's word. So the book of Romans has, to remind ourselves, has historically greatly influenced the church uh, Romans and Galatians are probably the two books that are probably most cited as being part of that. Um, that it is, it is impacted, that in fact um, uh, is chief of the New Testament and that it's purest in every Christian. I mean, this is, this is something that there's, it's not being um, hyperbolic or exaggerating to state that the impact of Romans on figures such as Augustine Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley. We, we've talked about some of that in the past. It's just an incredible is the, the, uh, the English Puritans would talk about the, the book of Romans. Uh, the impact on Martin Luther is well known um, and that the, he said that this epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament. It is truly the purest gospel. It's worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but that we should, uh, it should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. We can never read it or ponder over it too much. For the pure deal we, we with it, the more precious it is and the better it tastes. This is in his preface to Romans in 1522. Um, so Luther, as has been noted, was this Augustinian monk. Now remember Augustine, he himself, the, the Augustinian monks that come after, this, the, he, had, he wasn't a monk. In fact, Augustine came out of a very immoral lifestyle, kind of a cult-like living. And he had that tole lege moment, take up and read, and it was for Augustine, uh, for Augustine, um, Romans 13. 13, three, 13 and 14, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to satisfy its lust thereof. And it was reading that verse that Augustine was converted. It was through reading Romans 1, 16 and 17 and working through it that Luther himself had that famous tower moment where he would say, Greatly, I longed to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans and nothing stood in the way of that but that, but the one expression, the righteousness of God. That phrase, the righteousness of God, is repeated so many times in Romans. You, you, you heard it read there at the beginning, and he says, the righteousness of God. Because I took it to mean the righteousness whereby God is righteous and deals righteously to punish the unrighteous. Night and day I pondered it until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy he justifies us by faith. And here's what Luther says. Thereupon I felt myself reborn. And to have gone through open doors into paradise, the whole of Scripture took on new meaning. And whereas before the righteousness of God had filled me with hate, it now began to fill me inexpressibly with sweet love. The passage of Paul became to me the gateway to heaven. Um, he said later on, he said, I hated the righteousness of God it pun to punish his sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmured greatly. I was angry with God. And says, as if indeed it is not enough for miserable sinners eternally lost or original sin are crushed by every kind of calamity by the law of the Decalogue without having, without having God in pain to pain by the gospel and also by the gospel threatening us with his right, righteous wrath. And he goes on to say how he 
felt himself as he was born again and had entered paradise through those gates. Well, other countries and centuries later, and of course Luther, um, you know, sparked the Reformation and that spread and changed the Western world and so much of even our cultural ideas and uh, ideas of rule of law and individual soul liberty and things like that all come from Reformation principles. And then centuries later, a man named John Wesley, who was religious, disciplined in a holiness club at Oxford and yet unsaved, he had witnessed the faith of these Moravian missionaries at sea, that they had something that he didn't have, and, and, and attending a society at Aldersgate Street where there was a reading of Luther's preface to the epistle of Romans. And John Wesley said there, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. So there's just a few examples of how the book of Romans has impacted, and we can, we can trace it to so many great revivals throughout history. And so Romans is given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in, inerrant, authoritative, inspired of God, and God used the human instrument of the Apostle Paul to bring it to us. It tells us in Romans 16 that he uses... Um, the fancy word amanuensis, which is just a fancy word for like a secretary or someone who would take down and take down that. that um, he's in, so we see Paul's testimony that he is a religious terrorist. We see in Acts 9, if you want to go back and read his conversion. It's a dramatic conversion uh, that God saves him. So, when we, so who is he writing to in Romans? Um, that's not, that's not trivial information. This isn't just like stuff for like Bible trivia things. Um, the original historical setting of the Roman church is important for us to get what we're doing here. And even this, the setting of, of, of when this happened. So in chapter 1 in verse 7 he says, To all those who in Rome who are loved by God called to be saints. So depending on the source you'd read, the population of Rome at this time, so I'm thinking this is between uh, 56 and 58 um, AD, would be between 400,000 and a million people. And of that, they were made, that, that population made up of freeborn men and women and slaves, um, and 15,000 to 60,000 of that would have been Jewish residents. So how are there Christians in Rome? Um, who started the church in Rome? Well, it's not an apostle. There's, I mean, Paul's talking about how he wants to get there. He's already also said that he doesn't want to lay a foundation, build on a foundation that somebody else has laid. So he wants to go someplace new. So um, Paul, he, he, this is this is all there. We don't have a record of which apostle would have gone to Rome to start this church. Well, but we do know from Acts chapter two and verse one. That at Pentecost, there when Peter preaches, there is in Acts 2 verse 1, visitors from Rome. And so there were probably laymen, men and women. They're not necessarily apostles or elders or bishops. Um, and they believe and they go back and they start a church. Um, I've heard it said that the tip of the mission spear is not preachers, but laymen. Normal people, um, normal people that have normal jobs. This is the tip of the mission spear. I mean, not just in foreign missions, like some places that you can't say, hey, we want to go get visas because we we're going to go preach and start a church. No, no, no. It has to start with a business opportunity or teaching or things like this. And it, through normal work, God uses that. And he uses it uh, even in this day, in this time. Uh, we could see like Aquila and Priscilla, Lydia, others um, that were Phoebe, uh, others that were probably had businessmen and women that had important parts of this. So, um, also, just at side point, you can't point to a secession of bishops of Rome in the Bible. Something made up centuries later. Um, so, if you can think about that. Um, 
And then, okay, so the church at Rome is both Jewish and Gentile believers. Now, there's a particular historic event that is important for us to highlight what happened, um, and it was ha probably a major factor in the formation of the church, and it contributed to this internal conflict that's going on in the church. Um, and I'm assuming that uh, the, this time frame in the, the mid to late 50s, while Nero is Caesar. Um, so in AD 41, Emperor Claudius, who is emperor from 41 to 54, has the Jews expelled from Rome. And this was a, due to rioting and an unrest over a figure known, of, uh, known as Crestus, who many scholars believe is a distortion of Christos, or the Christ, so uh, factions over who the Messiah was. And so he has the, 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 the Jews expelled from Rome. So immediately at this thing, uh, when, this, when um, Claudius has this expulsion of the Jews, the ch church at Rome becomes almost an entirely Gentile church. And they're trying to wrestle through this. Um, years go by, and 54 AD, Claudius dies and Nero becomes emperor. And the Jews and Jewish Christians are freed to return to Rome. So now you have this church that's gone a few, several years being Gentile, and the Jewish Christians come back, and there's a lot of conflict. What are we supposed to eat? Can we eat this? Can we not? Are we supposed to observe this day or that day or this feast or that feast? How do we wrestle through that? And you can see that. Like if one if, if, if illustration I've given before is like that if, if one parent is, goes away on a deployment for six months, nine months, and comes back, all of a sudden, family dynamic is weird. Like, no, we don't do this, we don't do that, because they haven't been there, and now they're there again. And so they're working through those tensions. And so then that comes, well, what's the, the timing of this? And there's a timeline there on the screen. Uh, I believe this is kind of after Paul's third missionary journey. Uh, the timing is important for us to get. Um, and when we go to, actually go with me to the end of, Ro of Romans, Romans 15. Gives us some clues here. Romans 15, beginning in verse 22. It tells us this, and this is the reason why I have so often been hindered in coming to you. So he hasn't been to Rome, he's hindered. He says, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, since I have longed for years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed the company for, your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution to the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. So it gives us a little... Um, tip there of what's going on. Look at verse 16, chapter 16. He says, I commend to you your sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Senecre, that they will welcome her on the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for your life. To, who, to give, not only that I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Ep, um, Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked for you. Greet um, Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. So he, he's, he's speaking here of these folks, and he goes on um, and names these different folks that he knows and greeting one another. And so, I think I'll, I'm going to quote Douglas Moo about this. For almost 25 years, Paul's been planting churches in the eastern Mediterranean, and now he prepares to, to bring to Jerusalem a practical fruit of the work, one that he hopes will heal the most serious social theological rift in the early church, the relationship between Jew and Gentile in the people of 
God. So this, this, this section here, um, we, understanding these things about when and why Paul wrote Romans helps us get an idea of what's going on because it's typically seen a lot of books and even when you think of doing a Bible study when you think of Romans the first thing you think of is the theological tome the things about justification by faith and the order of salvation and uh, the union with Christ and it's very theological heavy theologically heavy but one of the things for us to zoom back and say wait recognize that, that Paul writes Romans as a particular letter to a particular church where there's a particular situation going on and so it is a summary of Paul's theology but it can't be the only summary of Paul's theology because frankly the book of Romans doesn't say anything about the Lord's Supper or ecclesiology or church officers the return of Christ so it's not even a completely worked out it's not like you can get your whole systematic theology from Romans um, and so why did Paul give us Romans it wasn't just a theological thing he said he desired to preach the gospel to all the that are in Rome preaching the gospel was central to to Paul now notice he says I've heard about your faith and your believers but I desire to preach the gospel to you. It shows that Paul's not seeing the gospel just as the initial part of evangelism, that it's the whole part of discipleship. It, it's not, there's not an explicit mission statement in the book of Romans like others. You could take Romans 1, 16 and 17 kind of as like a theme, an overarching thing, but, but he gives things that kind of outline the book. And so he opens up the book of Romans and talks about his plans to visit Rome, preach the gospel. He doesn't say the purpose. And in the middle of the book, he explains the gospel, um, going from chapter 1 through and how it affects and how it Im has implications on our life and our Christ how we live in the Christian community. And then he ends in chapter 15 and 16 talking about his plans to come to Rome, having completed his mission in the eastern Mediterranean on his way to Spain. And so we can find the purpose of Romans by fitting the comments that he's said with the occasion that he's doing, what, what he's trying to do. So he's been planting churches for 25 years. I mean, he's planted churches all over. And now he's taking that gift that we read about in Corinthians, and he's taking it to, back to Jerusalem, and he wants to go to Spain, and he's writing to Romans, almost like a missionary support letter, like, hey, I'm coming to you, and I want you to be able to help me on the way to Spain. Um, and remember, this is taking the gospel as far west as it's probably been. Um, and so, the common denominator in all of the statements, so he's, he wants to preach the gospel, he wants to get support for this mission to Spain, um, and Rome is probably the strongest regional church. He wants to resolve this, this, this schism in the church and bring unity to the church. So how does he do that? He wants to get the mission accomplished, getting the gospel there. He needs to get support for the mission to get the gospel to Spain. And he has to deal with this conflict in this church in Rome. And how does he do it? The common denominator is he focuses on the mission of getting the gospel preached and rooted. And I think there's a lesson for us in that too, of focusing on the main thing. He addresses this great rift in the church by focusing on the gospel so that the mission can continue. You know how we got to deal with problems and structural things is so that the mission can be empowered. He gives a thorough and careful explanation of the gospel. Um, and that, that, so the, even so we want to have, if, if when a church is in conflict and there's competing visions for the church, missions and supportive missions and focusing on the gospel are an important thing for us to keep rooted in it's all for God's glory because he talked about that in chapter 1 and so Romans is for us um, and so the gospel defines Paul and all of Romans is connected to it so he starts off by saying hey I'm Paul I'm an apostle set apart to the gospel meaning he's sanctified or set apart or set this is this is what I'm given to and then he uses the gospel to tell them how their worldview should exist, how they should see submitting to authorities, and how they should interact with one another, how they should even see how they eat. 
that the gospel has implications for all of this. He shows how the gospel defines the Christian community, that how the gospel drives the mission of the church. And he grounds all this pointing to Jesus, who is the person of the gospel. So Paul is set apart for the gospel. And he tells us right there in chapter 1 what this is. That it is the gospel of God. The source of the gospel is God. The object is God. Both is, is all focused on this and this relationship with the gospel. And he, he wants to share this good news and he goes, this is a gospel that wasn't something that he made up. There's not a, Paul, a gospel that Paul preached that the other apostles didn't. He says, no, this was preached, verse 2, beforehand. And it was concerning his son, that this gospel is all focused on Jesus, verse 3. The gospel centered on Jesus, the person of Jesus. He says that he's descended of David, it says there. This is, this is rooted in the Old Testament. He's risen, so the New Testament emphasis and focus on the resurrection. And then he goes on and says, I am eager, or I'm ready to preach the gospel to you in Rome. He is thankful. He says, I'm th I thank God for you. Um, so he's ready. He has this gift, and he uses, wants to use his spiritual gift to encourage them so they could be mutually encouraged. And he even talks about how he's a debtor. He owes it to them to preach the gospel to them. And this is why he is ready. And then he declares this confidence that he has in the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God. It's the power of God to save. That is where the power is. The power is not in who's preaching or how they preach or the, or, how, or the singing or the building or the marketing. The power is in the gospel. The gospel is powerful. Unleash it, brothers and sisters. Let the gospel be what it is. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is it is it, 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 it is foolishness to the natural man it's a stumbling block to Jew, block, block to Jews but to those who believe it is the power of God unto salvation he's proud of the gospel because in it the righteousness of God is revealed it's really the nerve center of the book of Romans when he says the power of God unto salvation to all who believe for everyone who believes he's saying that the gospel's for everyone not just Jews not just Gentiles not just a certain group of people, not a Western idea. It's for all peoples. And then he goes and outlines this righteousness. So he tells us in chapter 1 how we don't have this righteousness and how natural man suppresses the righteousness, the, the knowledge of the truth of the righteousness of God. It says, by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And this is the sinfulness of man that we see in Romans when people are depraved in their mind. And that they're without excuse of this. This is why the gospel is such needed. And the depravity of humanity is, is shows in this. And this is when he goes on in chapter 1. and talks about how they distort worship. And they worship the creation versus the creator. We see that in the world all around us. Everything's about worshiping the earth. And, and focusing upon creation. Um, distorting worship. Defiled morals. Um, taking, calling what is good evil and what is evil good. And then it goes on in the end of chapter 1, talking about these dishonorable passions that this unrighteousness people, I mean, speaking of homosexual activity and lifestyles, and he talks about debased minds in verses 18 to 32. And he, it's not like he's picking one, one sin as another. He talks about those that are disobedient to parents and unthankful, and this debased mind that comes out here, lumping it all together that all of this is sin. And then this, and all of this, because of all this unrighteous, we are under God's wrath. And then he spends time in telling us how we're all under it. How it's not it, that, that Jews are under it un, because of the law, and Gentiles are suppressing the truth, but religious people are disobeying it, and those that are non religious, all of us have on our own spiritual birth certificate under sin. We're all sinners. And that's it. Every, per, every, every person in Rome, every person in Linwood, every person in the whole world is either under sin or in Christ. And then he gives some examples. He goes, this isn't a new idea. He says, this is something that was in the Old Testament. He gives the example of Abraham and David. And then he taught how they're justified by faith and not by their works. And then he goes on in chapter 5 and tells us about the benefits of justification. 
and, and how it, all of this is grounded in the gospel, this, this, these gifts of, of justification, it, when he says in chapter 5 that we have peace with God, that we're reconciled, that the, the, the enmity is gone, that we now have permanent access, and we are now placed in grace. We are in grace. It was grace that led me thus, safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And then we're, we have rejoicing and hope. We have joy in the midst of suffering. I mean, this is a benefit of justification is that we can rejoice in our sufferings, that we have hope that we will not be disappointed in, and then that we have the love of Christ shed abroad in our hearts. We're objects of God's love. As Rich said last week, we're God's favorite. That, 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 that we, we're, in, we're loved by Him. The end of chapter 5 talked about the two realms the two realms and the inaugurator of those realms, either in Adam or in Christ, and what caused it and how it was there. And we find our identity in one of those two, either in Adam or in Christ. And when we're saved, we're brought to the realm of Christ. And then he ended chapter 5 with talking about these aspects of justification, how it was ju justification, our sanctification, and glorification. We sang about that in that song, Complete in Thee justified sanctified glorified now when he gets to chapter 8 which i can't wait to get to chapter 8 um he'll talk about this glorification a little bit but he talked about how we're justified in chapter 5 but this sanctification he talked about in chapter 6 of how our union with christ affects how we grow as christians now the christianizing of the christian and how our identity with christ that we we don't have to live obeying the old landlord that we can yield to the righteousness of Christ and follow him and walk with him and have freedom from sin and that we are no longer slaves to unrighteousness. And he'll talk about other things about how this looks in the world. All of this about the gospel. Paul went pretty deep about what the gospel is. Sometimes when Christians... I'm talking to, like, my tribe, you know, people that like theology and like talking about that stuff. There are people that want to talk about the deep things of the gospel and all those things about the order of how it's applied and uh, the extent of the atonement and, and, and all the different stuff about justification and things like that. And what the irony is is some of these people that want to talk about how deep, go really deep into the gospel— it doesn't seem like it affects them practically to want to get the gospel out. And then there's other people that are like, man, we're just going to go one, two, three, repeat after me and get as many people to sign a card and, you know, be a mile wide, an inch de deep, and win them, wet them, and work them, and just have a big old shindig, right? And, uh, and, and to them, the gospel is simply a few phrases and a yes and walk the aisle. And, and there's so much more. But I want to use a phrase, um, you know, when you wind something up and you pull something back and it shoots it out far, um, or, or that there is a sense in which, uh, J.D. Greer actually summed it up well when he said, the gospel is like a cyclone. The deeper you get pulled in, the farther you'll get thrust out. Um, the deeper you, if someone's really immersed into the gospel, it's going to thrust you out to make you a passionate evangelist. And by evangelist, I'm just, that just means the evangel, the good news, the one who goes about telling it. Some people get really, you, what you get really into, you want to tell people about. I mean, and you can always tell people. If, if someone's been, you could, you, I, I love it when you find what someone's been passionate about, you haven't talked to somebody about, and then you name a show, and they've been binge watching that show for the last four or five days. And they just go into all the deep and the back stories and the, the arcs and the thing with the characters and what's going on. And they just go into it and you're like, oh my word, they like are really about that. And then they, the next year they're sharing memes about that show for the, the, about every emotion they have. And they get really into it. Or, or whatever someone's into, that's what they talk about. The deeper you get into the gospel, the more passionate you're going to be about getting the gospel out. So, I'll close with this. Have you received the gospel? And I gave some illustrations at the beginning. You may be someone who is an immoral person, like Augustine. The gospel's for you.
You may be someone who's a moral, religious person like Martin Luther, um, and you need the gospel. You may be someone who's kind of a church boy like John Wesley, and you need the gospel. You may be someone who's like a, a Jewish person trying to obey the law or a Gentile barbarian uh, living uh, an immoral lifestyle and everything. And all of this is that the gospel is for you. The gospel's for everybody. And how do we overcome divisions in a church? They have a lot of divisions in this. How can we continue to be supporting the mission going forward, supporting the missions that we support? It's by getting rooted in the gospel. How can various groups within the church that have different views regarding practice and processes be unified? We'll get to that when we get to chapter 14. Some of these Christians think we ought to do things this way. Some of these Christians think we ought to do this way. Meet the idols, days, weeks, these things, festivals. How can we work together? And the answer is to focus on the gospel. So let's allow the book of Romans to change us. And let's kind of hope I've re-wet your appetite for Romans um, and, and, and that we would kind of be re-ramped into this to change us individually, to change us as a church. And oh, may we pray that as God has used Romans to incite revivals in the past that he might do that here beginning in my heart and in your hearts and our whole church and our community let's pray together